Thank you for joining us for this afternoon's panel on digital assets. My name is Chris Maturi, and I'm a first year MBA student at the McDonough School of Business. Prior to starting my MBA at Georgetown, I worked at CME Group in New York City and was on the team that helped launch the first regulated Bitcoin futures and options contracts, sparking my passion in the cryptocurrency and blockchain space. As someone who was looking to pivot into a career in this new and exciting industry, it was Georgetown's commitment to the digital asset space that drew me to this prestigious university for my MBA. Led by Professor Rena Agarwal, the Center for Financial Markets and Policy has become renowned for its support and dedication to the digital asset space and new blockchain technologies. One example of Georgetown's commitment uh, to the digital asset space can be seen through the new FinTech Fellowship that they are offering to MBA students. I'm extremely honored to be the first recipient of this fellowship made possible from the generous support of the University Ripple Blockchain Initiative. Through this fellowship, I have the opportunity to work on cutting edge research with faculty and take part in special networking opportunities put on by the center. I've already begun working on a research paper with Professor Alberto Rossi's help on the institutionalization of digital assets and look forward to sharing it with the center later this semester. Leading into today's panel, digital assets are no longer a fringe topic, but are now embraced by some of the biggest names on Wall Street. A recent survey from Fidelity found that of 774 institutional investment firms they surveyed, 80% found something appealing about digital assets and 36% already had some exposure to them. Whether it is the introduction of futures contracts tied to cryptocurrencies or the potential launch of a digital asset backed ETF, it is very clear that institutionalization of this space has already begun. And as the price of Bitcoin recently hit a new two and a half year high and set a new market capitalization record of $330 billion, I couldn't think of a timelier panel. So on the back of this, I have the privilege of introducing today's panel, which will talk about the future of digital assets. Our moderator for today's panel will be the esteemed Georgetown Law School professor, Chris Brummer. Professor Brummer serves as a professor and faculty director within the Georgetown Law School. Professor Brummer is a renowned speaker on fintech, cryptocurrencies, in financial regulation, and it was recently named to President-elect Biden's transition team. It is also my honor to introduce our other panelists, Perry Ann Boring, Zoe Cruz, Daniel Gorfine, and Sarah Olson. Perry Ann Boring is the president and founder of the Chamber of Digital Commerce, which is the world's largest trade association representing the blockchain industry. Perry Ann was ranked as one of Forbes' top 50 women in tech and one of the 10 most influential people in blockchain by Coindesk. In addition to her work with the Chamber of Digital Commerce, Perry Ann serves as a distinguished fellow of Georgetown McDonough's School of Business. Our next guest is Zoe Cruz, who rose to the highest ranks of Wall Street while serving as the co-president of Morgan Stanley. Zoe then went on her own into global investing before gaining deeper experience with new disruptive technologies in fintech through her work with Ripple. In 2006, Zoe was ranked number 10 on Forbes' most powerful women in the world list. Our next panelist, Daniel Gorfine is the founder and CEO of Gattaca Horizons, which is a fintech advisory firm. Previously, Daniel worked at the Milken Institute and was appointed, at, uh, was appointed by the chairman of the CFTC to become the federal agency's first chief innovation officer. Within that capacity, Daniel led the commission's new technology, innovation, and regulatory modernization efforts. Daniel is also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University's Law School. Finally, our last panelist is Sarah Olson, who is currently an executive director and head of business development for Coin Systems at J.P. Morgan's new business unit, Onyx. Prior to joining J.P. Morgan, Sarah was a managing director and head of business development at Gemini, a market-leading cryptocurrency exchange. Sarah is a fellow Hoya and received her bachelor's degree from Georgetown in 2009. So without th further ado, thank you again for joining us, and I'm sure I speak for everyone in saying we all look forward to hearing this panel. So thank you. Well, thank you so very much uh, for that introduction. And uh, 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 thank you uh, for this opportunity to come to, even if only virtually, the other side of campus to all of our friends over at the McDonough School of Business. We have a great panel uh, and it's one that I, I, I look forward to, to, to learning from. Uh, you know, when, when the business school and the law schools get to combine on things, uh, usually some good things happen. Um, and this is really one of those great opportunities for, for me as a, as a legal scholar, just to sort of listen to some of the real experts. Um, let, let's, let's maybe start off with the panel by, by um, some, some basics. Uh, I, I am a lawyer, so uh, we like to um, sort of you know, think about definitions, uh, especially when you use something like cryptocurrencies. Um, one thing you kind of notice is that there's a difference between what a cryptocurrency means as a 
term of art and there are different kinds of categories and ways in which you classify sort of what a cryptocurrency is. And then there are obviously sort of legal questions and um, uh, some would say more precise, some may say less precise definitions as to what a cryptocurrency is. Uh, but but maybe uh, uh, starting off with uh, you, Sarah, and then maybe to, to Perry Ann, uh, we have these words like uh, cryptocurrencies, utility tokens, stable coins sort of flown around uh, in the popular discourse and between many people in the ecosystem. You know, how do you conceptualize the differences between some of these really key and foundational concepts uh, in the market? Um, and, 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 you know, where do you think sort of the, 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 the conceptual difficulty lies? Because um, they're not always used in the same way. I mean, uh, particularly when trying to figure out, well, what's a utility token? What's a stable coin and, and, and the like? Yeah, we definitely like our jargon in this industry for sure. Um, I think sort of back to basics, it's really important when we're talking about cryptocurrency to understand that we're talking about software. So, you know, a blockchain is computer software that uses cryptography to send, store, and process data without the need of a central authority. And what that means is that any device running the software anywhere in the world acts as a record keeper, enabling true peer-to-peer -peer transfer of data. You know, and this is something that we haven't sort of seen before. Um, the first application we've seen of this technology is value transference, and the value that's transferred by this technology is what we're referring to as cryptocurrency. Um, we're using this technology, like, or we're using this term really, really broadly in our industry, but I tend to bucket into, you know, two categories. The first is what I call representative cryptocurrency, which is basically any monetary value that, you know, is transferred by a blockchain. And that can be anything. I mean, that can be fiat deposits held at a bank, it can be securities, it can be loyalty points, it can be your avatar. Um, but it's really, you know, using the blockchain as a tool for record keeping and ownership transference. Um, the second category, you know, and I actually think this is sort of significantly cooler, is what I refer to as native cryptocurrencies, which is basically the currency at the base layer of these computer protocols. And so something like Bitcoin, you know, and its function to the Bitcoin blockchain is it's not just a unit of value in the Bitcoin blockchain, it's also sort of the currency that powers these decentralized systems. So remember, again, we're talking about these distributed computer networks, you know, with participants all over the world. You know, there's not an easy on-ramp or on-ramp. So you need a native um, economic system to the software. And that's exactly what these native cryptocurrencies do. So yes, it's a unit of value in terms of transferring money via the systems, but it's also, you know, the currency that needs to be paid into processing data. And it's the, um, it's the currency that's awarded for um, those that are, you know, processing and maintaining that data, you know, in terms of record keeping. That's a process, you know, typically referred to as mining. And so, you know, th this is not just a, um, it it's not just monetary value that's transferred by a blockchain. It's really an entire economic system embedded into software itself. Um, and, and again, this gets, there's a lot more categories and a lot more terms for all of this, but I, you know, I typically bucket into the two sort of, you know, representing value in the real world and representing the value sort of inherent to the software. Yeah, very well said, Sarah. I'll kind of break down how regulators are looking at these tokens in the U.S. at the federal level. So FinCEN was the first U.S. regulator to issue guidance pertaining to convertible virtual currencies like Bitcoin, where they um, have said that they will be regulated like a currency. Uh, the second regulator to come out was IRS uh, defining them as property. And then the CFTC has defined them as a commodity. And then the SEC has said some may be considered a security. So depending on the facts and circumstances of a particular token and how it operates, it could have uh, you know, a variety of different um, regulators with jurisdiction um, over um, uh, the use of that token. We are seeing a proliferation of digital tokens being entered in the marketplace from a very large range of different actors. Um, uh, cryptocurrencies um, like Bitcoin um, and ETH are uh, really the, the innovations that are leading the way. Um, over two thirds of the total uh, market cap of all cryptocurrencies um, is represented by Bitcoin. Um, but then we also have uh, cryptocurrencies that have been introduced that are not intended to be used as a currency, 
which are in many cases what utility tokens are. Um, stable coins being pegged to, um, to, to something else like a US dollar and really um, being a representation of a dollar or a digital dollar. And then you also have to look at what the central banks are doing. So we have many different central banks. Uh, the majority of central banks around the world today are either interested in or already experimenting with central bank and digital currency. Um, and then also commercial banks like uh, JP Morgan and um, Wells Fargo have digital cash programs that they're working on as well. So I think one of the big questions that we have out there is as you're seeing many different stakeholders starting to issue these digital tokens, how are they going to operate in this new digital financial ecosystem? And that's what's being built right now today in an incredibly just fascinating area of, of innovation to explore. And, and, and I should have given everybody the opportunity to also expound on your incredibly impressive biographies, uh, you know, as, as modest as you all are. So please do so. Um, and we'll do it through the next time around. Uh, again, Perianne from the uh, uh, Digital Chamber of Commerce. Um, uh, and and, and uh, Dan Gorfon, I want to sort of build off of all of these terms that we've just now heard. I mean, you've had uh, experience over at the CFTC being the uh, 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 really director of Lab CFTC and all the many other things that you're doing uh, now. Legally, right, so we've heard these terms, central bank digital currency. We've heard sort of different ways of thinking about what a cryptocurrency is in terms of its functionality. You know, whether or not it's supposed to operate as, you know, some kind of thing similar to common equity, whether or not it is supposed to have some kind of other utility. Um, what's, what's the legal significance of these terms of art, uh, just particularly for some of the, 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 the folks on the, on the business school end uh, uh, who are really grappling with, with why there is this regulatory overlay in the first place? Sure. Thanks so much, Chris, and great to join all of you. I got to say, I mean, Perian, that was an excellent uh, description. Sarah, I think that was one of the best overall explanations of what people are talking about when it comes to crypto. Um, so I really appreciate that. And I might just for a second, you know, pick up on that thread, and I'm going to be even more simplistic in the way that I commit this. I think when people are talking about crypto and regulation, they are bringing in so many different concepts. And to boil it down, you know, I think that there's number one, there's the bucket of the technology itself, right? So when you're talking about cryptography and tokenization, and what does that mean for securing private keys and custody of digital assets? When you talk about the blockchain, these are new rails, new ways to transact these tokens. So there's like a, there's a question around technology that poses a regulatory challenge. The next bucket is what you're asking about, Chris, which is, well, what's the instrument? What's the asset? And at the end of the day, you know, in many instances, this actually isn't that exciting. You can tokenize all types of traditional financial instruments and assets. And the way that the U.S. regulatory system works is that we apply regulatory rule sets based on defining the asset or instrument. So if you tokenize a futures contract, it is still a futures contract and it would be regulated by the CFTC. If you tokenize ownership over a gold bar, well, it's a gold bar. Um, if you create a money market and you issue the, the, the security in a tokenized format, it is still a money market. So in many instances, the definitions are actually probably more clear cut than many appreciate, but it does matter tremendously because it's going to determine, at least in the U.S. system, which framework you're falling under. Now, the reason I flagged the technology as the first point, though, is that that poses unique challenges for any regulatory rule set. So for a banking regulator or a state banking regulator looking at custody and trying to figure out how do I get comfortable that this custodian is doing what it needs to do in order to safeguard assets, the question there isn't about what is the asset. The question is, do we understand the technology? Do we understand how private keys work and how you safeguard a private key? That's very different than a, a vault that would have safeguarded cash uh, or a gold bar. So the legal significance of these definitions matters tremendously. There are some areas where there may be some marginal ambiguity. Obviously, we had, you know, from 2017 to 2019, the ICO mania, which put a lot of pressure on the SEC to define, you know, when is something an unregistered securities offering, and at what point might it become kind of a more broadly held commodity. And that distinction matters a lot, again, to determine which rule set applies. But I think what's really exciting, and this panel's already kind of flagged this, 
digitization and tokenization is a much broader concept and it's going to hit traditional financial instruments and assets and impact the way that they're traded, transacted and regulated. Well, you know, th that is a lesson for one of the other questions in terms of the rule sets that apply, which is the robustness and resilience of the rails on which we are operating, uh, whether or not they be uh, sort of our Wi-Fi rails or other rails. But it does seem that my uh, that, that, that the Wi-Fi over uh, the District of Columbia is, uh, at least around my neighborhood, is currently unstable. But so... Um, let me just go to, to Zoe to ask then this, this other question. I mean, we had a discussion on um, clearing houses or, or, uh, earlier, uh, maybe a year or two ago, particularly in the context of, of, of crypto assets. Um, uh, you know, there's the technology, there's the asset, there are the rails, and then there are sort of the intermediaries uh, and, and, and the, really the, the infrastructure supporting different kinds of transactions. Uh, and, you know, clearing houses came up, uh, uh, exchanges uh, have come up in conversations, particularly when with regard to the intermediation um, that black, uh, or at least blockchain technologies uh, can decentralize critical infrastructures um, in, in many uh, ways. Um, you know, given this, this sort of the, the number of contracts cleared on exchanges, um, do you think, how, how realistic are these conversations? Because a lot of times when you talk about crypto, crypto can do, you know, uh, lots of things, uh, uh, but, but it's hard to sort of identify what's, you know, what are the upper bounds as to what is realistic when it comes to this really nascent technology and, and what it can do, um, uh, particularly with regards to legacy infrastructures like exchanges. Uh, what, what's, what's, what's your view? What do you find exciting? What do you find as overblown? What do you find as intriguing? Um, none of it is overblown. It is more exciting than it was uh, three years ago when I got a call from a headhunter to see if I wanted to join the board of Ripple and only three years ago, I said, I have zero interest in that world. <laughs> you know, it's, I don't understand it. And it's as Jamie Dimon said, who is my contemporary. I went to business school with him actually. Uh, you know, I kind of agreed with what he said three years ago. So three years later, I believe, I think it was Sarah that said, this is one of the biggest revolutions, uh, paradigm shifts. Uh, those kind of things don't happen overnight. So it's a false choice to say it's either the current exchanges that process in nanoseconds, millions of trades, or this thing. To me, the right way to look at it, it is, if you accept the fact, it is a, uh, a revolution that involves both the technology and the cryptocurrency, the digital currency, that as Chris Larson, the founder of Ripple says, the internet took a decade basically to have transfer of information, transfer of knowledge. You're talking about transfer of value. So it's huge. It will have a lot of bumps on the road, uh, but it is unequivocal. It will change a lot of things. And, and the way I look at this is I'm old enough to say I joined Morgan Stanley right out of business school in the early eighties. Uh, it was a private company it was 2,000 people. When I left in 07, it was 60,000 people and it had offices everywhere. So that was a huge revolution. The one that said finance was globalizing where you were putting users of capital with providers of capital in the global arena. That was huge. So to me, it's, uh, it's not gonna take 20 years for this new thing to, to really cement itself but it is beginning to disintermediate to me as all disruptions happen from the bottom. And what I mean by that is of the seven plus billion human beings in the world, over half of them are either underbanked or unbanked. So you're talking about the traditional finance that you're talking about. It works perfectly well, by the way, if you're Morgan Stanley wanting to send a billion dollars to Citigroup, it happens instantaneously, and uh, the Swift uh, Swift messaging system or Swift 2.0 is perfect. So that's the correspondent banking system. If you're an SME in Nigeria, not so good. 
So this actually decentralized finance is banking the underbanked. It's giving access to the global financial system to the people that nobody has an interest in serving at the moment. So yeah, it, yeah go ahead. So, so, so when you get to that question, particularly on, on scale, you know, when you think about different blockchain rails, there's always this question about to what degree can you really scale and support uh, uh, not just uh, large transactions, but large numbers of transactions. I mean, I mean how do you view that, that challenge? Um, do, you know, where are we in terms of meeting that, that, that particular challenge? So the technology exists, certainly, uh, and it is, uh, uh, to me, uh, fortunate with the incredible sophistication of cybersecurity that has become very sophisticated as well. Um, so I think the technology and some of these cryptocurrencies, by the way, they have very different use cases and design. So that's why people talk about Bitcoin. It is probably a nice, uh, nicer, um, uh, expression of uh, digital gold, if you will, but it, in its design, each one of them has pluses and minuses in terms of scalability of transactions. XRP as an example, it is, its market cap isn't as large, uh, to state the obvious, as Bitcoin, but its design, which actually was designed by the NASA uh, scientists that, that designed it, as an antidote to the Bitcoin problem, which is it can transact in nanoseconds, very high volume, low value business. That's what it was designed to do. So I think there will be different rails, different utility tokens, if you will, for different use cases. And Dan, I'm going to just follow back since you obviously have a, a, a quite storied career over at the CFTC uh, and, and you've you know, spend some time thinking about uh, exchanges as, as well. H how do you view the question of disintermediation given what you saw over at Lab CFTC um, uh, and, and the potential for this particular technology as it pertains to um, sort of key infrastructures in, in, in that world? Yeah, like clearing and, houses and, and sure. exchanges. And like. So it, it's a great question. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to categorize some of these developments around crypto in the same way that I think about fintech kind of more broadly. And that is that some of these new underlying technologies and business models do seek to either disintermediate traditional players or transform the way that intermediaries operate. And I think both of those dynamics will occur here. So I'll try to unpack that a little bit. I think there absolutely will be new players. There will be new market entrants that will offer a fundamentally different way for market participants to trade and transact. That does not mean, however, that this is going to operate outside of the regulatory perimeter. I think instead it's, it's far more likely that they will either become a new type of an intermediary or put pressure on regulators uh, to recognize that traditionally defined intermediaries are now operating in a new way. Um, you know, as for traditional players, I think many will and already are adopting to these new technologies or adapting rather to these new technologies. And this is going to put pressure on regulators to keep up. I mean, I think Sarah and Zoe are case in point in terms of what we're seeing, you know, within the market. Now, I will say as a final point, I think this touches on this, this, this notion that's getting a lot of attention right now around DeFi. Um, and, and, you know, I think that as an as a initial starting point, there's a lot of incredible innovation taking place with software, with driving greater um, efficiencies, kind of reducing the amount of, of need for certain types of intermediaries. But I will also say that I struggle with the notion that this is going to be fully decentralized. So why do I say that? It's because at the end of the day, I think a market where trading occurs is almost by definition a centralized place. It's obviously a place where people congregate to trade. So there is a, there's a certain amount of centrality to that model. Now, again, it may be that the nature of the new business models or the nature of intermediaries is changing, but you may still have some intermediaries nonetheless. Now, so this is going to, you know, I think we end up somewhere in the middle here. I don't think that a lot of these actors are necessarily going to end up fully outside of the regulatory perimeter. But at the same time, it means that regulators are going to have to look at the world where it currently is and realize that traditional definitions of intermediaries or traditional rules may make very little sense in this context. So, you know, to take a, a very balanced view of this, I think we do end up somewhere in the middle. I think that you will have new market participants 
who will be winners in this system. I think you're going to see a lot of traditional players who adapt incredibly well, but it will still operate within a system that's regulated. And part of that is because I think markets demand, you know, trust and integrity. And some of that comes from having a properly defined regulatory perimeter. It will require adaptation though on all sides. I, I mean, you know, uh, certainly these are uh, new technologies, some, you know, without having had a long and, and established history. And so the question is, well, how do you create, you know, trust and, and, and the like and assurance in terms of their, their, their operation, but also in terms of their uptake? Um, you know, uh, uh, Perry ann you know, what do you view as, as both the, the market and regulatory challenges associated with the adoption of, of, of digital assets, you know, by, by institutional in, in investors. Um, uh, you know, what are you seeing in terms of how large asset managers are including them? I mean, obviously Sarah had, had outlined before, and I think you, you had as well, some interesting um, uh, statements made by luminaries uh, over in, in Wall Street. Uh, where do you think that curve is heading? Um, uh, again, with these asset managers, um, and, and, and what, again, are the regulatory and market challenges associated with those asset managers um, uh, holding those particular digital assets in their portfolios? What, what are their major concerns, and what are their, their, their major uh, interests? I think we're still at very early days of institutional investors entering this space, and some of the challenges really have less to do with regulation and more to do with reputational risk. People just still don't really understand this and they're not willing to put their career on the line to advocate for the adoption of cryptocurrencies for their clients. Um, and two is education. Um, Bitcoin, uh, if we just kind of break this down, um, I'll just start with Bitcoin. Bitcoin has very little correlation to traditional asset classes, whether that's the S&P 500, US bonds, uh, real estate and others. Um, in 2018, the St. Louis Fed issued a report and they said, quote, Bitcoin will emerge as their own asset class and thus have the potential to develop into an interesting investment and diversification instrument. And that diversification piece is key. And that's exactly what we are just starting to see happen. So for um, investment advisors who understand this and note that there, there's very little uh, formal training and education around adding digital assets for investment advisors today. For those who have taken the time to really understand this or get to know it on, on their own, what they're seeing is that by adding just small amounts of a digital asset, um, whether that's Bitcoin or something else, into a diversified portfolio, it will increase the risk-adjusted returns. If you take a traditional portfolio with stocks and bonds and, and allocate even just 2% in the Bitcoin, the sharp ratio increases and risk decreases. And very sophisticated investors are starting to understand this. Um, from Fidelity, Square, you have Paul Tudor Jones, Bill Miller, um, Drunken Miller, uh, public companies are starting to buy Bitcoin because of its diversification um, attributes uh, like micro strategies um, and others. So it's, I, yeah. Again, we're in early days of institutional investors adopting this. We're starting to see um, a lot um, uh, more uh, traditional actors enter this space. And from a regulatory perspective, it's that regulatory clarity that continues to be a challenge. Um, I think we have, you know, regulatory, you know, uh, uh, D decent um, understanding of where Bitcoin and ETH sits. Um, but for XRP on down, um, there is very little certainty about if these digital assets are considered a security in or, or not. So an issue that probably Zoe can um, <laughs> speak to and, and sympathize with because we don't have regulatory certainty for all digital assets, uh, different um, institutional investors may or may not be willing um, to take on um, that, 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 that risk. And that's a big issue that the Chamber of Digital Commerce has been working on for a number of years with SEC, the CFTC. This issue has gone to the courts. There's members of Congress have introduced legislative proposals to address this. Uh, but I do believe, I'm very optimistic and I, I do think this will work itself out. Can I just add something to what Barry Ann, I mean, what she said about uh, diversification is spot on. Um, 
But I would say the biggest issue with regulatory, lack of regulatory frameworks, there's obviously the US issue of three, four regulators, each with their own views. Uh, but as importantly, when I look at traditional finance, it exploded in terms of positively, if you will, because you had a BIS, you had global institutions with global principle-based regulatory frameworks. So what Perianne said about uh, XRP versus Bitcoin, it's really a US issue. In the UK, we're viewed as, uh, XRP is viewed as a cryptocurrency uh, in Asia as well. And so for me, the real focus for the industry uh, should be, and that's uh, early stages where, you know, I'm trying to uh, find uh, willing uh, participants in this dialogue, how can we create the BIS equivalent, the, the principle-based global framework? Because if you're gonna talk about cross-border payments, mm -hmm. you need that global framework to work. That's one issue. The other about diversification, I would say the institutions are brought into this fidelity as well uh, and others kicking and screaming as fidelity will tell you 70% of their clients, it was reverse inquiry that pushed them into the space. Um, and the reason uh, I think investors, uh, and that to me is the most critical point about in life, you have to be in the right place at the right time. Innovation alone is not enough. Uh, $190 trillion worth of stocks and bonds, 100 trillion in bonds and 90 in stocks. Uh, again, in the 80s, uh, if you were a 60, 40, 40, 60 portfolio, which is the four decades that made my career, um, you actually had 30-year uh, treasuries in 80s were at 14%. And let's say that was not the mean, the mean was five to 8%. So you had risk-free rate of returns at 8%. Half of your portfolio being in a riskless asset with that yield is not that bad. And in stocks, you had actually cash flows. You had people that had not just a business plan, real cash flows, low leverage. So you had a 60-40 portfolio that produced exceptional returns. That $190 trillion now is half of it is producing zero because <laughs> uh, the Chinese just issued five-year bonds at nine basis points. This is Ch mainland China. So, so for me, the real issue, the, the 190 trillion, if a percent of that gets diversified along the lines that Barry Ann said, a percent is $1.9 trillion. There is you, you, you know, Sarah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of switch to this question to even the more fundamental question of sort of the intrinsic value. I mean, like, you know, when you, when you talk about correlation, there's also this assumption of, of, of value and, and even how do you sort of sort of price, you know, any kind of value to this um, to these different kinds of digital assets. Um, uh, just as a, as a side observation, sort of as we move to this to the question of fundamental values, you know, when, when we talk about institutionalization, I, I had once on my uh, I, I have a podcast called FinTech Beat, and I had Nick Carter sort of appear on that particular uh, podcast, and he made an interesting observation, um, and I don't know what the data would 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 show, but it, it, it had to deal with what happens or really it's a query, what happens when you have more institutionalization of this particular, of, of digital assets? In other words, do, does the entry of, of institutional actors mean that they adopt to sort of a new asset class and so they develop new tools or are they bringing their tools to the new asset class? In which case, would there be some weird point of convergence as you have greater institutionalization or is you know are those are the most sophisticated people sort of saying to themselves well this is something different so we'll develop other kinds of tools and I think um, uh, from what I understand from, from what he's saying you know that's that's going to be something really interesting to, to keep your eye out on as as the market itself sort of shapes itself um, out but but I get stuck on the on the very question of sort of you know the the importance of of, of again, the, the, the underlying uh, value. I mean, there, for, particularly for institutional investors, there isn't a widely established framework, and this is going a little bit to, to what Zoe was, was, was mentioning, um, in terms of getting there, in terms of making an assessment. 
And as a result, you know, many people do view price changes as the product of speculation as opposed to sort of changes in fundamental value. Um, Sarah, like, how do you view this? I mean, um, uh, do, do, do you think- I, spend, I definitely spend a lot of time thinking about it. And when I was working for Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss in my old job, we always kind of had the conversation being like, is this technology with a money overlay or is this money with the tech overlay? And, and most of the time, I think that, you know, all, all three of us came out of, you know, the, the former, um, you know, that this is really new technology and, you know, in which you can, you know, has new sort of financial principles. Um, in terms of valuation, I think, you know, hopefully I don't offend too many people listening in, but like the, the kind of worst conversations I've had with folks about this technology have always been with money managers. Um, and I think that's predominantly for two reasons. Um, one, it's really difficult to, to value networks in general. And we've seen great investors like Warren Buffett just miss the mark in terms of understanding the compounding value of internet technologies. Um, and then like to my earlier point, again, this is a new economic system where you have value embedded into the technology itself. And so say that you were like, in, you know, if you understood the promise of the internet several decades ago, you were still investing in the equity or debt of internet companies. And so your valuation methodology looks somewhat similar to the other things that you were getting investment exposure to. This is totally different. So you have to understand the value of the network and then you have to understand how these sort of virtual commodities exist within this network. Um, could you explain you know, that? Could, 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 could you go a little bit further on, on that particular string? Yeah, so it's, um, you know, so so think of it like, you know, crypto is, a, if a blockchain was a car, crypto is kind of the gas that makes it run. And so again, you know, you're talking about, you know, a lot of times this technology being used as a way to, you know, power these networks and create, you know, alignment of incentives between all of these decentralized participants, you know, which is a really, you know, new concept. Um, and, I, and I think that that becomes, you know, difficult a lot of times to, to understand the value of. So you basically, you have to understand the value of the network. And that means understanding that you have to underwrite the technology itself. So, you know, what can I do with this computer software? How scalable is it? You have to understand applications that can be built on top of it, which is where the compounding value of kind of this type of technology comes from. And then you have to understand too, you know, okay, so, you know, if there's this cryptocurrency that's embedded into it, what does it do? You know, is this what I pay to send messages? Is this what I, you know, um, is this used as a sort of a, a voting mechanism in terms of how a, a, a network is upgraded? And this is really, really technical stuff. Um, there's now kind of a good base layer of, you know, investors who are really approaching this technology really thoughtfully. Um, and who are kind of underwriting all the different elements from a bottoms up perspective, um, but it's still sort of few and far between. And so, you know, I would say when we think about valuation, you know, we have to throw away a lot of old principles in terms of how we think about, you know, valuing these types of financial assets and, you know, and really almost, you know, uh, transform our mind, you know, to seeing the world in this new sort of decentralized way in which, you know, these financial assets and technology kind of go hand in hand. Yeah, that, that was a really interesting answer. I mean, Zoe, did, did you want to add to that? And, and, and maybe even also Dan, you know, like, you know, it, it, these are new kinds of instruments, different kinds of, uh, of financial products, new different kinds of, of technologies. You know, th that valuation process, what, what, what should people be looking at uh, when trying to, to gauge uh, the value and what fluctuations in value could possibly mean? I think what Sarah said is spot on in terms of how do you think about the value of a network. It, the reason this whole world is being repriced parabolically higher is again, the macro context where journalists call me and they say, you know, you've been, you've seen uh, this movie before. And I say, no, actually I've never seen this movie before unless you're alive in the twenties and thirties. None of us have seen this movie before. And what I mean by that is we're now uh, printing a trillion dollars a month practically. So it's the macro context where the hurdle rate for investments has gone to zero. That's the hurdle rate. And so by definition, if you're investing in moonshot opportunities, moonshot opportunities is 10X versus you lose some money. That's what VC investing is all about. 
And I think that's where we are. There is enormous amounts of money looking for a home. And they say, it's uh, not zero the possibility I lose all my money because it could be all of the regulators get together and they outlaw this. I don't think that's the case, but it's not zero. But I could make 10x, 100x. So I think the value of those networks, which will succeed, I don't know if the current top players, Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP, are the Netscapes or the MySpace or the, the Facebook or Google. But one of them will be and the other one will be the other side. So that's why I think you have to superimpose uh, the construct that Sarah described so well within the macro context, why this is a feeding frenzy. Yeah, this is, a, this is such an interesting topic. And I actually had I, I'd given a, a lot of thought to this a few years ago. I actually published a piece, you know, thinking about how do you value cryptocurrencies? And, and it's interesting. I think that there is this concept that became very prevalent, especially during the ICO kind of mania days, um, that cryptocurrencies should be thought of, or at least from a valuation perspective, you know, akin to a security, that there's going to be a pure supply and demand dynamic that's going to somehow continue to bid up a cryptocurrency into perpetuity. And then, you know, it dawned on me as a thought experiment to maybe take cryptocurrencies at their word, like they're defined as currencies. That was the objective. That was the intent. And if you start to analyze valuation, through a currency lens, you can go back fundamentally to a question like, what's a currency? Well, it's a unit of account, it's a store of value, and it's a medium of exchange. Now, I would suggest that to the extent a cryptocurrency is serving as a medium of exchange, actually being used for transactions, there absolutely will be a supply and demand dynamic up until some kind of equilibrium point. So what I mean by that is the day a cryptocurrency is created, you know, there's zero demand for it, there's probably very little value. As people adopt it as a currency to actually use it to transact, yes, there's going to be a, potentially a finite supply, there will be demand, and you will see a curve that's going to potentially look steep. What it goes to, I have no idea. At some point of maturity, you would expect that it will start to operate as would any other currency. There will be some kind of like an equilibrium state. If anybody who's really into the econ, think about purchasing power parity, where you're going to start looking at currencies and saying, well, you know, you, there's only so much you're going to pay for this currency if its absolute buying power has to equate to like what a dollar could buy you. So then where I think that leaves us in the long run is that the long-term values and long-term appreciation for a cryptocurrency, I think will largely be tied to its store of value attributes. That's where you get into this conversation of like, you know, is Bitcoin digital gold, digital silver? I like to joke sometimes, like I would say it's digital bronze. Like there's some hedging angle aspect to it. It's viewed as a hedge to the, you know, printing of, of, of fiat central bank money. Um, and I think that could hold. I mean, I, I, I don't know what, what, what the answer is there, but um, that's, a, that's a compelling justification. Now, my, I'll leave with this thought. I think that there's a limited universe of the number of tokens that we're going to see that would take on a true kind of ubiquitous store of value attribute. Like in my mind, maybe, and again, I agree with Zoe, I don't know if it's Bitcoin or something else. Maybe the world hones in on a few that really, you know, demonstrate stability and can be a long-term store of value as well as a medium of exchange. I'm a little more circumspect that we're going to have a world of thousands of cryptocurrencies that are effective as a medium of exchange and for some reason are also viewed as a true store of value. Um, so that's that's really that's, in the weeds. I, I, it, it, that was an excellent and and, and really interesting answer. Uh, uh, just just to follow up with that, and then I I think I'll ask both Sarah and Perry Ann, you know, their their thoughts, uh, particularly in these last couple of minutes. You know, when you think about the regulatory sort of topic du jour, and you yourself have been highly involved in it, is this question of you know of of, of a digital dollar or or, or a uh, central bank digital currency. I mean, you know, when you get to when you make that that progressive move to CBDCs, uh, what does that do to the conversation uh, on all of the cryptocurrencies that we've been talking about? Number one, you know, and 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 even is that a tool? I mean, this is we haven't even gotten into the stable coin question. Uh, you know, we need maybe an hour, an extra hour or two for that. But uh, you know, what, what does that do to your analysis? Um, uh, uh, and how does it change, perhaps, how one goes about even that pricing process? 
you know, yeah. like, does having another sort of a digital fiat currency change the way in which you start to evaluate um, uh, the pricing of different uh, crypto assets? So I'll try to be pretty quick with this because I know we're, we're limited yeah. on time. I, I don't, so, so in, from a digital dollar project perspective and certainly my perspective, I don't view a, a CBDC or a US digital dollar as in any way antithetical to any further private sector innovation or ongoing innovation. I mean, I think the way I would think of it is, is this. Money printed by a central bank is, is the ultimate kind of public infrastructure, right? That is a central bank backed dollar. And we made a design choice at some point a long time ago that the way that most retail individuals are going to access a central bank uh, backed currency was going to be through cash or coin. That's the way that most retail individuals would hold it is a literally a dollar bill or a quarter. What we're proposing through things like a digital dollar is that you can enhance the public infrastructure of money by creating a digital format of that cash and coin. Now, just as you saw happen with our current design choice, private sector innovation builds on top of and in the gaps of where you're going to have public infrastructure. I think that's exactly what would happen here. If anything, you know, if I'll leave you with one last analogy on this. If you, can, you can think about it like the building of public highways. When the government created public highways, that's public infrastructure. Did that impact private transport businesses? Yes, of course it did. But it actually unleashed even more efficient, more effective uh, private transport businesses. I think the same thing happens here. The innovation around programmability, specific use cases for money, um, you, you know, all that you can do in terms of developing and designing smart contracts for ultimate efficiency around money and transactions, I think that continues to happen. I think if Bitcoin is truly serving as a store of value, well, that doesn't go away because there's a digital dollar. I mean, there's still plenty of room for these types of innovation. So I, I truly do see it as kind of lifting the fundamental infrastructure, and you'll see a lot of private sector uh, innovation built on top. Sarah, yeah, that's a that, that's a very key point um, that Daniel is making. And I, no one really knows what's going to happen with the introduction of a U.S. digital dollar, other central bank digital currencies, and the continued growth of the cryptocurrency marketplace. The key difference I see between something like a U.S. digital dollar and something like Bitcoin, it's not the technology, it's the monetary policy. And the reason why investors are buying Bitcoin and other digital assets today is is because of it's it's operating as a store of value. Like what Ms. Cruz said, Bitcoin is an expression of digital gold. Where I think this is going is that you'll have Bitcoin as the foundational layer and central bank digital currencies being the transactional layer. But we have a long way to go in, uh, in continuing to evolve the international financial and monetary system. But one of the things that I think is going to be key for central bank digital currencies to be uh, successful is that they will be interoperable with cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, like ETH, like XRP. So individuals have the option to go between different monetary policies based on what they're using it for. Can I just, I know we're out of time, but can I just uh, add a point of diversification that matters? The mountains of money, the 190 trillion is the first point of diversification. And we said even 1% is $2 trillion coming into the space. The second piece, once it comes to this space, the religion of institutional money is risk adjusted returns, diversified portfolios. So I'm working actually with a reputable, well-regulated index provider to say, what are the pluses and the minuses of Bitcoin? And there are some minuses in addition to pluses, XRP, Ethereum, Polkadot, which something didn't exist a few months ago. It's now hundreds of millions of dollars of value. And based on that diversified portfolio, you diversify idiosyncratic risk of each of those currencies. And so you have a bet on one of these winners, but you don't say, I'm gonna put all my chips on red. I think that's a very critical point that 190 trillion understands very, very well. Sarah, I'll let you have the last word if you had any thoughts. On the CBDC uh, and its implications for uh, pricing and, and other uh, cryptocurrencies? Well, I, I think I agree with Dan in the fact that I think that that this is really complementary to a bigger, you know, system that is being built. You know, what, what blockchain is, is really building a new 
in hopefully better internet. And so, you know, all of these other, um, uh, you know, all these other ways in terms of interacting with it, whether it's, um, you know, a, a CBDC or whether it's, you know, essentially like a commercial bank token, you know, are just creating sort of better on and off ramps in terms of, you know, for everyday people or companies to be able to interact with this technology. And so, you know, I, I don't speculate on kind of like the price of Bitcoin, um, and especially because I'm pretty bad at it. Um, but, uh, you know, but I would say is that better, better infrastructure, you know, whether that's provided by our governments or our banks for this technology will make this technology more valuable. Yeah. Well, I, well, I have found this conversation very valuable, as I'm sure all of our listeners have. Uh, it was really a pleasure to hear uh, such expertise, and, and uh, I, I, I certainly learned a lot. Thank you, perry Ann, Zoe, Dan, and Sarah so much for having joined us. I will be passing, I guess, the baton back. Uh, but, but again, I, I appreciate you for, for joining us here over at Georgetown.